His father saw it and had compassion for a man and fell on his neck and kissed him. And he said in verse 20, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. From that particular text, I had to learn something about the relationship between the father and the son. Number one, the father loved his son. Number two, the father taught his son the truth. Because the boy knew that he had sinned against heaven. So, it wasn't the father's fault. It wasn't the older brother's fault. Then whose fault was it? And the answer is, it was the prodigal son's fault. And his fault alone. Now you may be wondering what the point is trying to make, preacher. Okay. I have seen this numerous times in my life. Where a mother and father brought their child to worship services, tried to teach their son the truth, tried to teach their daughter the truth, love their child, and then their child grows up and leaves the Lord and leaves God and goes into the world into sin. <laughs> and the parents are sitting there going, what did I do wrong? And I have seen parents beat themselves over and over again over the sin of the children. Now, if that's describing you, listen real close. Stop blaming yourself for your children's choices. If you love them and you taught them the truth, if they leave God, it's because of their choices and it's not your fault. Bye-bye. My mother and father loved me. My father was an elder. I was taught the truth. I was teaching Bible classes at one time. It wasn't that I didn't know the truth. It wasn't that I wasn't loved. I was tempted and I liked sin. It's really more complex than that. Your children were tempted. They liked the sin. They want to stay there. But let me tell you something. Because you love them and you taught them the truth, if they do go astray, they have something to come back to. The younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country. Okay. But when he came to himself, he had something to come back to. Years ago, I was watching television, and there was a news reporter interviewing a 15-year-old girl who was living under a bridge in Los Angeles. The girl was a prostitute. And the news reporter said, you're a prostitute, you're 15, you're living under a bridge. Why don't you just go home? And this was her answer. It's worse there. She had nothing to go back to. Let me tell you, if your parents love you and teach you the truth, if you leave God, the truth is in your mind and it haunts you. And the whole time you're out there in a far country, you know you're lost if you die in that condition. And the truth you cannot shake. But because you do have the truth, you understand what love is because you've experienced it and you've seen it in your family. If you love your child and taught them the truth, you've given them something to come back to. If they ever do believe God. So stop blaming yourself, please for your children's choices. Getting back to Luke 15, 13, it says, In not many days afterward, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. I have a question for you. Why did he go to a far country? Why did he just stay in town? Why did he build a house on the outskirts of the community? Why did he even stay in the country? I can tell you why. He knew what his intentions were. He intended on partying. He had money. He had a full money bag, full belly, nice clothes. And so he's going to a far country where nobody knows him. And now he can live the way he wants to live. Look at some scriptures with me. From Job 24, 15 to 17. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight. Say, no eye will see me. And he disguises his face. Dropping down further, it says, if anyone recognizes them, they're in terrors of the shadow of the death. Okay, I got a question for you. Why are they doing this at night, these adulterers? Because they don't want anybody to see them. 
They even go as far as disguising their faces. And if anybody finds out what they're doing, they're terrified. This is what I call professional hiding. I know. I was a professional hider. Nobody knew me. I hid my sin from anybody that would be offended by it. And I hid my faith from anybody that would be offended by it. Everybody liked me. And nobody knew me. You see, because when you're sinning, you don't want mom and dad knowing. You don't want your children, your brothers knowing. You don't want your sisters knowing. You don't want the brother that you grew up with you knowing. And so you hide. You hide your sin from people around you. Barbara began chapter 7, 8 through 10. And passing along the street near her corner, he took the path to her house. Verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and again in verse 10, and there a woman met him with a tire of a heart and a crafty heart. Here this man go into the prostitute's house, again in verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. He's doing it in the middle of the night when everything's dark and nobody can see him. He knows where he's going, he knows what his intentions are, and he doesn't want anybody seeing him. That's why the prodigal son went to a far country. He understood what his intentions were all the way, and he didn't want anybody knowing what he was doing. He didn't want an older brother coming after him. He didn't want that saying, what are you doing? He didn't want anybody saying anything. So let me ask you this. Exactly how far away do you have to go to be in a far country? Well, in your circumstance, it's about 10 miles. <laughs> you can go 10 miles from here and nobody know you. You want to find out what your real character is? Your real character is how you live when nobody knows you. When sin is right there in front of you, you've got opportunity to do it. And you do not give in to the temptation. Nobody knows you. Nobody will see. Those who do see will know who you are. But there's something you understand. Even though you may be able to hide it from everybody else, you cannot hide it from God. Mark 4.22 For well, there's nothing hid which will not be revealed, nor anything being kept secret, but that it should become to light. You may be able to fool everybody. Hide it from everybody. But you know the truth and God knows the truth. And as long as you have that situation where you recognize the truth and you know the truth, the truth is going to eat at you and haunt you. You will never be able to shake the truth once you know it. And you have never fooled God. Going back to Luke 15, but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Verse 16 says, and he was glad he had filled his stomach with a pot and the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. It's a very simple lesson here. The way of the transgressor is hard. If you're going to choose to go into sin, there's going to be all kinds of consequences of ramifications of suffering that's going to come into your life because of your choice to go into sin. Proverbs 13, verse 15. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. Again, in Proverbs 22 and 8. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail. If you're going to sow iniquity, there is going to be a harvest. And the harvest is going to be sorrow. When you choose to go into sin, there are consequences and ramifications that come into your life. All kinds of suffering coming into your life because of your choice to go into sin. One of the things that irritates me nowadays is how now you can advertise any kind of alcohol you want on television. The advertising on television tries to make you think that people just drink their alcohol. If you're a man, all the women will be attracted to you. 
if you're an athlete, you'll be the greatest athlete in the world. And I'm getting you better than this. Go for all the gusto. Have a great life. Drink their alcohol. But that's not the real world of alcohol and drugs. Proverbs 23, 29 through 30 is the real world of alcohol and drugs. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger along with wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. How much beer or alcohol do you think it would sell if they showed you a drunk husband beating his wife and children? Don't think it's a good commercial. Or how about this? A college student or a high school student hugging a commode vomiting. No, that's not really going to sell it, is it? How about somebody's brain scattered over the highway? The real world of alcohol, the real world of drugs, is a life of sorrow. <coughs> A life of wounds without cause, where you don't even know what you did. You don't know how it happened. Sorrow in your life, <coughs> sorrow in the lives of all around you are connected to you. If you're going to choose to go into the world, the world is cold, the world is hard, the world is empty. There's no love. And it will destroy you. There's a way that may seem right. May seem pleasant at the beginning. The end there of death. The further you go down that path, the more it destroys your life. Luke 15, 13. Not many days after he journeyed, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there are ways of possession of the body to live. But then when you get to verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to himself, to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. Had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. <coughs> he went to a far country, in verse 13, and then he came home to his father, in verse 20. There's a simple lesson, but an important lesson. As far away as you go from God, that's how far you have to go to come back. He went into a far country. When he went to the far country, and full belly, nice shoes, nice clothes, bag full of money, everything looked good. After the famine, nobody gave him anything to eat. When he came back home, he had no food, he had no shoes, his clothes were rags, he had no money, and he had a far country to come home from. It was a tough journey home. The point I'm trying to make to you, brethren, is this. It's not easy coming home as a prodigal son. The further away you go, you've got to come back down that path. And what temptation it is that you said yes to that you thought was so wonderful, that took you away from God, you're going to have to come back to it. And you're going to have to face it. And you're going to have to say, no! I'm not going to do it again. You've got to face your sin and finally repent of it. Coming home was not easy for me. I felt like putting my name on the front pew because I spent so much time there. Any help you can get from anybody to help you home, take it. Anyone who can encourage you, anyone who can pray with you, take it. Because getting home is hard enough by yourself. And everything you faced that took you away, you've got to face it again. And finally say no. And stay away from it. This time, don't go home. There's an interesting phrase here in verse 17 of Luke 15. So when he came to himself, I thought about that phrase. 
he came to himself. Where was he? The, the idea is, he wasn't thinking straight. He wasn't facing reality. He wasn't living in the real world. And he keeps thinking, it'll get better. I can keep going this way, and it'll get better. I can make it work, it'll get better. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. You're down with pigs. Looking at the pig slop, thinking it looks pretty good. He finally opened his eyes. He finally came to himself and recognized the reality of where he was, how he got there, and what he needed to do to get out of it. He had to arise and go home to his father. Simple lesson, very simple lesson. Nobody can come home for you. You have to come yourself. And you gotta come home yourself. Nobody can repent for you. Nobody can drag you to God. All we can do as individuals is show people the right way we believe they should go and encourage them to go that way. But we cannot make anybody do anything. The only person I have control over is me. Anybody who comes home to God has got to come to themselves Stop lying to themselves, face the truth of where they really are, and then deal with it and start working as best as they can to get back home to the Father. You know, I'm just talking a little short joke here. Sometimes I wish, as an elder, that we were allowed to use shop collars. <laughs> to where if you're not at worship services, Can't do that. <laughs> Encourage them, exhort them, and show them the right way to go. You pray with them, you plead with them. But you can't drag them. You can't force them. It's got to be their free will choice. They got to come to themselves and they got to realize this is the right way to go and I'm going to go this way. Even though it may be difficult. I'm going to go the right way. Mm -hmm. Getting back to Luke 15, this is my favorite part of the whole text. This father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck, kissed him. How often do you think the father looked at the horizon? He knew there was a famine in our country. And he wondered how his son was doing because he knew it was over there. And one day he looks up and he sees a figure that looked kind of like his son. A lot thinner, I remember. Pretty ragged looking. But he sees him on the horizon and he immediately knows, That's my boy! runs out to him. When he sees him, he falls on his neck, kisses him. Who is this talking about? You know who this is talking about. This is talking about our God. Our God who loves us more than anyone. Our God who knows where we are and how spiritually dead we are and the destruction that's in our life because of our sins. Of wanting us to come home. Beautiful lesson here. You can always come home to the loving Father. Always. Satan will whisper in your ear. He doesn't want you anymore. You can't go back. Not after the way you live. You think you can come home. You think you can go to heaven. You. After the way you live, you may as well stand there. That's not true. God loves you. 
He had never stopped loving him. And when he would come home to him, he would receive him with open arms. The text says in verse 24, For this my son was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. He began to be married. Going out to stray sheep is difficult work sometimes. The further they are into the mountain, the longer they've been there, the more difficult it is to get them home. But let me tell you something, brother. There's nothing like it. When they finally come home and stay home, <clears throat> it's a time to rejoice. Because somebody was spiritually dead. Now they're alive. They were lost. Now they are found. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. We should rejoice with them as well. And this takes us to the last part of the text. And that part of the son, brother. He was angry and would not go in. And he says in verse 30, But as soon as this son of yours came and has devoured your livelihood with hornets, you killed a fatted calf from him. Who's this talking about? This part of the text is talking about those of us that stay home that are faithful to the Father. To have the right attitude when somebody who is coming back home repenting, to have the right attitude of rejoicing with them and for them and encouraging them rather than saying, what are you doing here? I remember years ago, in Grenada, Mississippi, we were a small town, so everybody knew what you did. I was working at a grocery store. One of the young men who worked at the grocery store with me saw a girl walking by outside, and he said, you see that girl? And then he started telling me all the things that she was doing in the community, and I was thinking, oh, no, I worship this girl. And come to find out, everybody in the community knew of her immorality. One day she came in the building. Came in and sat down. I heard somebody whisper behind me, she's got some nerve coming back here after what she did. I remember thinking to myself, what well, exactly where do you expect her to go? You said, brother, that's the older brother. What are you doing back here? Look at you. We know what you did. All right. Yeah, we know what you did. Welcome home. Brethren, listen to me. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all broken our Father's heart time and time again. We just went away from God different distances. As far away as you go, that's how far you've got to come back. If you take a few steps away from God, you've got a few steps to come back. But if you go to a far country, you've got to come from a far country, and you've got to cross every step all the way back home. For any time anyone comes home, Galatians says in chapter 6, verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spirit to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Be careful, brethren. You may be thinking, well, I never do that. You better look out. If a man think that he stands, he need to take heed lest he fall. If you start thinking you're above temptation, and you're above sin. Satan's got you where he wants you. And it may be you. You find yourself committing sin that you never thought you would participate in. It may be you who's in a far country. It may be you who's finally coming before the brother saying, I have sinned. Rather than when someone comes forward, the second Corinthians says, Reconfirm and confirm your love to them. Forgive them and encourage them. 
and listen to me very closely. Please listen to this last point. Just because they come forward doesn't mean the battle's over. It's just beginning. I told you I was ready to stop you. Nobody ever asked me what was wrong. Nobody ever asked me what the problem was. Find out where they are. Encourage them afterwards. And realize they're in a spiritual battle for their soul. And Satan is not going to let up on them just because they come forward and repent. To the contrary, they're going to be hit that very day before they go out the building. He's going to hit them, hit them, hit them again. And they're going to need your encouragement to be beside them, encouraging them, praying for them, being patient with them if they stumble again. And continue to exhort them and help them until they finally get home and stay there. This is what I sometimes tell people. If I can make it to heaven, anybody can. If I can come home, anybody can. And when they come home, you are rather to forgive and comfort them. Reaffirm your love to them. And then realize they're going to need some exhortation afterwards, too. Good, come up, hug them. Don't know that you love them. Yes, good, that's good. But check up on them the next day and the next week. Call them and ask them how they're doing. If you need to go visit them and spend time with them, whatever it takes to help them finally stay home and not go back and get entangled in the same old family. I appreciate your kindness. This is one of my favorite texts. Anybody who's ever left the world is probably one of your favorites too. Because I'm here to tell you, brethren, it is wonderful to be forgiven by our Father. It is wonderful to know your heart. If this sermon describes you in any way, because you need to realize this. You can be here in the building this morning and be in a far country spirit. You may be doing a wonderful job deceiving everyone around you. The great hider, wonderful hider. But God knows and you know where you are. If there's sin between you and your God, do it. Recognize where you are. Come to yourself. Face the reality of where you are and start coming home. Repent. The brother will pray for you. They'll pray with you. They'll do the best they can to encourage you and strengthen you. You're not alone. If you're not a member of the body of Christ yet, and you honestly believe that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, if you're willing to openly confess that faith and motivated by your faith, make a great commitment of repentance, we're glad to assist you and baptize you for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to the gospel call in any way, let us know. Always stand in this song.